I have been asked by Henri, the maker of this film, to say a, a few words about who I am and how I happen to come to Tiruvannamalai and spend all my adult life here. In 1974, I was at Oxford University, not particularly enamoured of the course I was on and spending most of my money, and money I didn't have, on spiritual books at the university bookstore. Every week I would go down there, buy a new book, take it home, read it, and all those books ever did was activate my curiosity to go, go out and buy another book the next week. Then one day I was down in the bowels of this bookstore in the oriental section and I was just putting my finger along the row of books and somebody on the other side of the stack of books was doing the same thing and that person must have pushed their side and so on, on my side one particular book fell out and I caught it in my lap and that was Arthur Osborne's teachings of Ramana Maharshi in his own words. So I thought, that looks interesting, that's my book for this week, I'll take this home and read it. So I paid my money, I went home, I probably read it in about two hours, and the difference that this book, the difference in this book and the effect it had on me was that when I finished, there was no desire to go out and read any more books. There was something about getting the teachings of Bhagavan directly from his mouth, if you like, in his own words, that he took away all my interest in anything else, in finding any intellectual solutions to spiritual problems. He also put me in a state of silence, the state that his teachings were pointing at and indicating, and there was a kind of peripheral knowledge that if I did ever have any questions, then there was something so perfect, so complete about his world view, his explanations of the world, how it functioned, what the mind was, how it appeared, how it disappeared, that whatever questions I might at some future point have, there was something in this system, in this set of ideas which satisfactorily answered them all. But at that moment I didn't need answers to questions, I didn't have any questions, because simply reading Bhagavan's words cut out the necessity of having to do anything to find peace, find silence, do a practice to attain a result. Those words themselves put me in the state which his books were pointing towards. So that saved me a lot of money. I didn't need to go out and buy books anymore. I carried on with my course with an increasing degree of intellectual dissatisfaction. Uh, I didn't have the vocabulary to explain what the problem was. But later, I think it was I couldn't really accept the validity of an academic approach which was reductionist. The whole of academia is premised on the idea that you can take something, pull it apart into its tiniest possible functioning units, have a look at all these units, then put it back together again and have an understanding of how something is or how something works. It's very atomistic, it's very reductionist. And I actually felt physical revulsion when I read textbooks that were trying to explain or categorize the world in terms of small categories which were subsumed in larger categories and so on. A point was reached when I actually opened a textbook and I had to control a strong feeling of nausea. I actually wanted to vomit at the content of the books in front of me. There was such a resistance to looking at anything that tried to explain the world in an academic way that it made me physically ill to read two sentences on a page. At that point I realized I couldn't continue with the course anymore. I went to see my tutor, I went to see the head of the college, I explained my situation and possibly being a little bit idealistic I, I probably told them I'd found something better and more interesting. And then I took off and decided what I needed was a long period of solitary meditation by myself, away from the influence of all my friends, all the various sensory indulgences that you get up to when you're a student. So I went off to the west coast of Ireland, rented a small cottage with an acre of land, I grew my own food, I took three books with me, which were the Arthur Osborne books on Ramana Maharishi. I read them, I studied them, I practiced for about, I'd say, seven or eight months. Very quiet, very peaceful, I somehow felt I'd got off the roundabout of Western life. I'd 
got back to my source, I had got back to my sense of I, how it rose, how it subsided. Towards the end of that year, the person who owned my house asked me to leave because he had been uh, blown up on a building site in Australia where he didn't have medical insurance. So he needed to sell his house to pay, pay his medical bills. So I, I decided to go to Israel and live on a kibbutz for six months because I couldn't stand another cold European winter. And then at the, the end of this, those six months, my plan was to come back to Ireland and carry on meditating. However, about five months into this Israeli trip, uh, the thought arose in me, I, I have some spare cash, I have no particular obligations this year, why don't I just go to Raman Ashram for a few weeks, check in with this, uh, this Ramana Maharishi I've been reading so much about. There was a kind of a pull, I wanted to go there. Now, this was an odd decision because I had already written to Raman Ashram asking for more books and they hadn't replied. So the knowledge I had at that particular point, or my assumption, was that Raman Ashram didn't exist anymore. I knew nothing about ashrams, I just thought that when the Guru died everybody went home. So I had absolutely no idea what I was going to find when I, get, when I arrived in Tiruvannamalai. I just had this perverse recurring thought that I'd be hacking my way through a jungle looking for a, a gravestone with Ramana Maharshi's name on it. That was all, all, all I could imagine happening when I got there. But somehow I felt I had to go there and somehow connect and touch base with this man who'd transformed my world view and my sense of who I was and what I was doing in the world. I, at that point, didn't have a lot of cash and going to India wasn't the cheapest option for the next year. So I did my accounts and realized I was 200 pounds short of a trip to India or the amount I thought I needed to go there and come back. So I just looked at my little picture of Ramana and said, okay, if, uh, if you want me to come to Tiruvannamale, you've got to send me 200 pounds. Then about two days later, I got a letter from my grandmother's lawyer who died several years before, the grandmother, not the lawyer. And he said, we've just found some private shares uh, we didn't know she had them, we've sold them off, and your share is 200 pounds. So I thought, okay, that's it, that's the sign, I'm off to India. So I came here in 1976. I'd already been here as a tourist in 1972, but that was a non-spiritual visit. I came here in 1976 solely for the purpose of um, connecting with Bhagavan, connecting with the places he lived. I arrived, I think I fell in love with the place almost immediately. Uh, Within a few weeks, I realized this is where I want to stay. And somehow, without any rational thought, I think it was made clear to me, this, this is your home, this is where you need to be. And as soon as I let go of the idea that I was here for a visit, and that this was my home and this is where I needed to be, everything fell into place and I've been here ever since.